Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. And we're going to start out with the release from the Fed today, uh, Board of Governors um, policy meeting uh, minutes. And uh, we're going to look at the markets in a second here. But I want you to read with me through some of the gobbledygook that comes out of the Federal Reserve. Um, I'm just going to read the, the end part of it. Um, most of the first part of it is just uh, them restating their policy. So they say here, to support continued progress toward maximum employment and price stability, the committee today reaffirmed its view that the current zero to quarter percent target range for the federal funds rate remains appropriate. In determining how long to maintain this target range, the committee will assess progress both realized and expected towards its objectives of maximum employment and 2% inflation. These are the two they always harp on. This assessment will take into account a wide range of information, including measures of labor market conditions, indicators of inflation pressures and inflation expectations, and readings on financial and international developments. The committee anticipates that it will be appropriate to raise the target range for the federal funds rate when it has seen further improvement in the labor market and is reasonably confident that inflation will move back to its 2% objective over the medium term. The committee is maintaining its existing policy of reinvesting principal payments from its holdings of agency debt and agency mortgage-backed securities in agency mortgage-backed securities and rolling over maturing treasury securities at auction. This policy, by keeping the committee's holdings of longer-term securities at sizable levels, should help maintain accommodative financial conditions. When the committee decides to begin to remove policy accommodation, it will take a balanced approach consistent with its longer-run goals of maximum employment and inflation of 2%. The committee currently anticipates that even after employment and inflation are near mandate consistent levels, economic conditions may for some time warrant keeping the target federal funds rate below levels the committee views as normal in the longer run. So that's the statement out today. Um, yeah, i am gone over their 2% inflation target and unemployment and the gobbledygook they spew. I'm not going to go over it again here. I, I read that just so we can take a look at the market reaction. And it's my contention that it isn't the market reacting. It's actually the Federal Reserve intervening in the market to produce a supposed reaction. So let's take a look at the charts here now that we have that in mind. So the release of these minutes were 2 p.m. So the first thing I want you to notice here, well, the you can see on the member side, I posted a, a chart of the gold price and I did the lines here because this was a very interesting formation we had here. You can see it was actually a pennant that was building right into the release of the minutes right there. And then of course we got the smackdown right there at the very moment of the actually you can see that they front run a little bit do you see that uh, this is the one minute chart so they actually front run the minutes which makes sense because this is such a consistent pattern that the federal reserve is doing this um, it doesn't matter what now obviously this Federal Reserve statement is probably more dovish than anybody would have expected. That would be very bullish for the precious metals. So uh, we can see right on cue. It's actually this little blip right there, that little candlestick you can see is, is some of the front running volume. Then we get this one and we get this one. And then really the first major volume doesn't come down, you know, down in here. Uh, and then we get kind of a rally from there. So it's very clear that uh, the minions of the Fed or whoever is doing it um, attacked gold and silver right on cue. Now I want to show you, 
keep in mind the volume. You can see the entrance of the volume in both gold and silver, a massive volume comes in right there at the release of those Fed minutes. Now, another chart we want to look at here is the Euro US dollar, just to give you an interesting comparison. So you can see here is the 2 p.m. release right there of the Fed minutes, but look here. The volume in the euro does not come in when those minutes are released. The action in the price happens, but then we see a massive stabilization of the euro coming in. Um, because, and of course, does it make any sense? Not really. Why would the euro fall? The euro was rallying. You can see if we go out to a larger chart, you can see that the, the euro has been on kind of a tear and then it was release of those minutes um, that knocked it back. So what I want to do with this chart is I want to take the silver chart and overlay it. We'll, we'll go ahead and take off everything here and then we'll just do a silver overlay so you can see. What I'm trying to show with this is that the reaction in silver um, is pronounced uh, it's obvious and uh, it's sustained as opposed to what happened to the euro. So we know that in the euro, they came in right there and uh, whoever was, you know, doing this, um, this move is been kind of countered here and you can see what happened with the euro. Silver, on the other hand, you can see it's right falling now. It's going into new lows and uh, so this massive volume that attacks silver uh, is continuing to do its work. So we'll, we'll pull up gold and see if it, it, it's the same thing here. Uh, actually, we want to do euro and then we'll just pull gold over the top of it. And this is the gold overlay. So you can see the same thing is happening with gold. I've pulled other uh, charts. I pulled oil. I pulled a whole bunch of things. Um, so really what's going on here? Well, the same thing that's always happened. It doesn't matter what the news is. The Federal Reserve and their minions always attack gold and silver when there's a release of their minutes. It doesn't matter what the minutes say. Uh, the, it's a pattern that they continue to do and I'm not really sure why they do it. It's kind of strange because it's becoming so obvious. In fact, as I pointed out before with silver, um, it's becoming so obvious that when you look on the volume, as I pointed out before, you can see that they're actually starting to front run these things. Uh, and people know what they're going to do. So they're actually making money. Hopefully the people who are making money off of this are silver stackers and they're turning around and putting the money into physical silver. So you can see that silver had quite a good run. It was on kind of a rally phase right until those minutes were released. You can see now we're in a new kind of volume phase. Um, I have no explanation as, as to what these bizarre surges in volume mean. So I want to go over to a story here. Um, this is a story I've been following all day. I'm sure everyone has heard about the riots in uh, Baltimore and what's behind them. This is a article from Michael Snyder's economic collapse blog and uh, it's interesting to see him kind of start to go into the conspiracy mode here. Um, as I said, I've, I've looked at this all day. I've spent a lot of time looking at this. The rabbit hole goes way, way too deep for me to do any kind of um, analysis of what's going on here. I'll just tell you my initial impression is that this is a PSYOP. Um, it seems that there are some agent provocateurs, maybe crisis actors. I don't know. I'm, I'm still investigating it. But uh, this article kind of gives you the questions to ask and he says 12 unanswered questions about the Baltimore riots that they don't want us to ask. 
Uh, first, why are there dozens of social media accounts that were linked to the violence in Ferguson now trying to stir up vi violence in Baltimore? And that's a good one. Uh, that's a, that, that's going to be a long rabbit trail to chase. Number two, who was behind the aggressive social media campaign to organize a purge that would start at the Mondawanman Mall at precisely 3 p.m. Monday afternoon? Number three, even though authorities had credible intelligence that gangs would be specifically targeting police officers on Monday, why weren't they more prepared? On Tuesday, the captain of the Baltimore police tried to make us believe they weren't prepared because they were only anticipating a confrontation with high schoolers. Seriously, <laughs> that's crazy. Number four, where were the Baltimore police on Monday afternoon when the riots exploded? During the rioting, CNN analyst Jeffrey Tobin said, quote, the disappearance of the police for hours this afternoon is something that's going to haunt this city for decades. But that we've seen that before. We saw that in Ferguson. We see the police disappearing. So there are definitely some hidden strings uh, being manipulated behind the scenes here, in my opinion. Why are number five? Why are police officers in Baltimore claiming that they were instructed to stand down during the rioting? We've heard that before. Number six. Why was the decision made ahead of time to set a curfew on Tuesday night, but not on Monday night? Number seven. Why were so many police vehicles conveniently parked along the street in areas where the worst violence happened? After the destruction of a number of police vehicles on Saturday night, the Baltimore police had to know that they were prime targets. So why were there even more police vehicles available for rioters to destroy on Monday? And where were the cops that should have been protecting these vehicles? Interesting. Number eight, why is an organization funded by George Soros stirring up emotions against the police in Baltimore? Why indeed? Number nine, why is CNN bringing on commentators that are promoting violence in Baltimore? Mark Lamont Hill, a Morehouse College professor and regular CNN commentator, embraced radical violence in the streets during an interview Monday on CNN. Quote, there shouldn't be calm tonight, he told CNN host Don Lemon as riots raged in the streets of Baltimore. Black people are dying in the streets We've been dying in the streets for months, years, decades, centuries. I think there can be resistance to oppression. Hmm. Number 10. Why did Baltimore Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake initially tell reporters the decision was made on Saturday to give, quote, those who wish to destroy space to do that, end quote? That's a crazy one. That is insane. Number 11. Why were rioters given hours to cause mayhem before a state of emergency was finally declared on Monday? Maryland Governor Larry Hogan seems to think that Mayor Rawlings Blake waited too long to declare a state of emergency. Number 12. Does the fact that the mayor of Baltimore has very close ties to the Obama administration have anything to do with how events unfolded during the riots? The following is from Infowars.com. Rawlings Blake was one of the three mayors who provided broad input into President Obama's task force on 21st century policing, which advocates the federalization of police departments across the country by forcing them to adhere to stricter federal requirements when they receive funding. Quote, the federal government can be a strong partner in our efforts in build building better relationships between the police and the community, she said in written testimony before the task force. That would explain her inaction to stop the rioting when it began. By allowing it to spiral out of control, the mayor and her friends at the Justice Department could use the unrest to justify the expansion of federal power into local law enforcement, which would also allow her to receive more funding. And why did it take Barack Obama several days to publicly condemn the violence in Baltimore? Why didn't he stand up and say something on Monday when the riots were at their peak? Something doesn't smell right about all of this. I absolutely agree. In fact, this thing stinks to high heavens. Now, 
if you remember, Obama made a very strange comment when he was campaigning to be president in 2008. He made a comment about how we need a military, a domestic military that's larger than our foreign military. And that was a really strange statement. Uh, is this, are we starting to see this come about? Now, I want to show you something here that indicates this is not completely a tinfoil hat thing. This is actually an article that hit the news tonight. Prisoner in van said Freddie Gray was trying to injure himself, document says. A prisoner sharing a police transport with van with Freddie Gray told investigators that he could hear Gray banging against the walls of the vehicle and believe, quote, he was intentionally trying to injure himself, according to police document obtained by the Washington Post. The prisoner, who's currently in jail, was separated from Gray by a metal partitioner and could not, partition and could not see him. His statement is contained in an application for a search warrant, which is sealed by the court. The post was given the document under the condition that the prisoner not be named because the person who provided it feared for the inmate's safety. So um, another interesting pattern about these riots, we saw, we saw it in the Trayvon Martin thing. We saw it in, although there weren't riots, but there was a rush to judgment. We saw it with the Ferguson thing. Now we're seeing it here in Baltimore is they want to get this stuff going before we have the facts. And that's really important because, uh, you know, most of the time the facts are actually, if, you, if you're going to believe the facts presented, I'm not suggesting that you have to or should, but if you do believe the facts that are presented or come out after the fact of these events, that normally it's in the police's favor. Now, this is leaning that way. And uh, I don't know whether it's one way or another. The, the, like I said, this rabbit hole is too deep for me to go through it. But I wanted to show you something that's very interesting. A statement that comes up in this Washington Post article um, that uh, is very, very telling. I don't really know if it was their intent to give this away, but it's clearly given away. So they talk about that prisoner and they talk about what he heard in the van. But listen to this. Bats has said officers violated policy by failing to properly restrain Gray. But the president of the Baltimore Police Union noted that the policy mandating seat belts took effect April 3rd and was emailed to officers as part of a package of five policy changes on April 9th three days before Gray was arrested. Gene Ryan, the police union president, said many officers aren't reading the new policies updated to meet new national standards. Do you see that? That's the giveaway. There are new national standards. So this isn't such a tinfoil hat thing when you think about it. They're already admitting that they were rolling out national standards and that this incident is connected to these national standards that the police weren't following. Very, very interesting. That InfoWars comment may be correct. This is about nationalizing the police. That's pretty scary. So let's get back to the silver chart. We know that the silver price is manipulated. We're pretty sure that it is manipulated by the Federal Reserve. And we know that whenever the Fed meets, whenever the Fed releases minutes, whenever the Fed does anything, we immediately see an attack against the precious metals. It happens time and time again. Uh, it's not consistent with other markets. In fact, it's more dramatic. Um, if you think about if the markets were viewing that the Fed's action um, would have some impact on the economy and that impact on the economy would come and have an, 
impact on um, industrial production, which would then have an impact on silver, etc. If that were the case, then you would see this type of action in other markets and you don't see it. You see this attack on high volume come in specifically against gold and silver. And that's why we know that gold and silver, especially physical gold and silver, are the mortal enemies of this trapped Federal Reserve. This trapped Federal Reserve that keeps having to release these statements of why they have to keep interest rates at zero for now moving, we're moving towards one decade of this, believe it or not, because the financial crisis hit in late 2007 and we're coming up on 2016. So we may be looking at a Japanese type of situation with a lost decade, lost two decades, lost three decades. Uh, the Federal Reserve, um, I'm going to stop calling them lunatics. Uh, I'm going to have to come up with another term, uh, but their policies are absolutely insane. And we'll talk to you next time.